Hi, we're now starting section 10 of our notes, and we're going to talk about Monte Carlo methods. Uh, so this is a completely different strategy philosophically to these analytical approaches we've been thinking about in the last few videos. Uh, and with this video, I want to just do some introductory uh, remarks about what the process is and a couple uh, kind of key background concepts. So uh, looking at our table of these reliability assessment strategies, we've wrapped up now this, these exact, we're, we're in the exact method section, and we've wrapped up the kind of the top row where we this is most most importantly this is our form algorithm here so right form and then some various flavors of it like form we transform ourselves to normal space so the probability distributions we related them to normal distributions through our transformation cases and then we approximated the limit state function as linear and then we got a failure probability that was analytical right, that was the nice thing we get a number out of it you get the same number as me we've got a formula we've got things like our gamma vector to look at sensitivities so those are all nice things, but it required these kind of transformations and approximations. So our alternate strategy we're going to talk about now, it's also an exact method subject to some limitations. We're going to do new, just numerical sampling. So we don't have any sort of transformations. We don't have any sort of limit state function approximations. We get a failure probability, but it's going to be sampling based numerical. And, and so there'll be some trade-offs there and then we'll explore. So let's talk through a little bit of the details of this concept. So the... The idea is that this is a very flexible approach. We've got a lot of generality, no, no approximations needed in terms of limit state function. They're also pretty easy to implement. So the tr one trick here is we have to sample from a target distribution. But once we've generated those samples, the rest of the work is pretty easy for us. So the implementation is pretty straightforward in this approach. But there are going to be some drawbacks. No nominally, we may need a lot of samples in order to solve the problem, especially depending on which Monte Carlo approach we take. And that can be problematic if the limit state function is expensive to evaluate. It's also just a sampling-based uh, answer. And so the answer we get for probabilities of failure is gonna have some uncertainty around the finite samples we take. And we'll explore how exactly, how uncertain that is. We can kind of quantify that a little bit later. But let's talk about the basic approach here. And so I'll call this crude Monte Carlo. Sometimes it gets called you know, brute force Monte Carlo. This is just the basic approach. And later on, we'll tune this up to see if we can address some of the limitations of this approach. Okay. So the idea, step one, we're going to simulate realizations of the random variables, and we're going to simulate them from our target distribution. So that joint PDF of X. Step two, we're going to evaluate the limit state function for each simulation. And then step three, we're just going to count how many of those simulations gave us a, an outcome where the limit state function said we had a failure. So to, to think about that with this picture down below, so the left bottom left figure is the figure we've been looking at all quarter where we've got a couple random variables. We've got contours indicating the probability density function for those random variables. We've got the limit state function and we've got the failure domain in gray. Okay. So instead of trying to evaluate that reliability integral, we're just gonna take samples and we're gonna sample from that joint PDF. Okay. Over on the right hand side, I'll say, when we draw in some dots that are our samples, we'll get most of our samples where that probability density function is highest in that kind of center circle, but we'll get a few that are out in the uh, tails. So let's say those are our samples. So maybe we'll draw a little arrow just to indicate. So those are our sampled realizations, the joint PDF. And is it, so as long as I'm generating, the, uh, generating those consistently with kind of my joint PDF, the number of samples that I get out in the failure domain should give me an indication of the probability of failure. So let's see, in this case, I have one, two observations that are out in the failure domain. And then I've got uh, a total of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 s samples that I've generated just in this kind of cartoon case. So I'll say my probability of failure estimate is two over 12. And I'll put a little hat on it to say that it's a, it's an estimate. Okay. And the idea would be that the samples, if they're coming from a target distribution, this is like numerical simulations of what would happen in the real world, right? So with some probability, I'm going to get X samples that are out in that upper right corner. And however often that happens is telling me how often that would happen in the real world. And so I can just count how many of my simulations produce these failures. Okay. So we get rid of all this Hassoffer-Lind reliability index or Hassoffer um, 
Rackwards Faisler algorithm, we don't have to search around for design points. We don't have to do any transformations, right? This whole picture stays in X space. There's no need to go to normal space because we're not doing any analytical solutions. So lots of the algorithmic stuff that we've been developing, we don't have to worry about. The only question is how do we generate these samples? We'll talk about that for a bit. And the other issue is if this is a very safe system and the probability of failure is very low, I might be generating a lot of safe outcomes and not very many failed outcomes. And I might need a lot of samples in order to really get a sense of how likely these failure probabilities are. So those will be some issues we'll explore a little bit in the future videos. First, let's just talk about the very basics of simulating random numbers. And some key concepts here is that we're going to simulate pseudo random numbers. So pseudo means that they're, let's see if I don't have it on the side. So these are algorithmically generated, but effectively they're random. So there is some sort of algorithm, which is reproducible, but especially if we started off with a random seed, that we don't have any ability to see that they're different than random. There's some, I've got some 203 notes on that, that some of you have seen talking in more detail, but let's move on for today. And you can, we can talk more about pseudo random numbers if you want some other time. Most of the time, most of the algorithms and things that do this focus on generating uniform random numbers between zero and one. And then we just transform those to have some other distribution. So the backwards of, of our transformation, the standard normal space here, we're starting with, with kind of uniform space, but we can transform backwards to an arbitrary distribution. And it's actually very similar to the backwards transformations we've been using uh, in the class. But first with these uniform num random numbers, we can always come up with those. So MATLAB, Excel, Python, any software package you're interested in is going to have a function typically called RAN. And that's going to generate a uniform random number between zero and one. And again, we can keep in mind it is an algorithmically generated number. So for some very high precision, important applications, there might be a question that what's going on in this algorithm and will that inf influence my result for anything that we're doing in this class, they're perfectly suitable there. They work really well. Uh, and then I guess some notes at the bottom of kind of a section out of the 203 slides that, that covers a little more of this. And then there's also plenty of books about this. So the gentle book is a pretty good reference book uh, if you're looking for more information. Okay. So once we get a uniform random number between zero and one, we need to turn that into a, a random number sample that comes from the distribution we'd like, because in general, we're not just interested in uniform random numbers. And the trick here is that if we take X, which is a random number with an arbitrary distribution, and we put it into its own CDF, so that's a function of a random variable. The output is going to be a random variable. So let's call it Y. And it turns out that Y is uniformly distributed between zero and one. I've got a proof, quick proof on the next slide about that. So if that's the case that I can put an X into its own CDF and get a uniform random variable between zero and one, that means I could do the reverse. I could take Y, a uniform random variable between zero and one. I could put it into the inverse CDF for X and I'll get out an X which is my random variable of interest. So if you're saying, I, I want some samples from this, of this random variable X, and so just give me the inverse CDF for that random variable, and I'll supply the Y's out of the RAND function, or at least samples of the Y out of the RAND function, and that'll produce samples of X with this bottom formula. Okay. So that's the idea. The, I guess as a quick background slide, we can do a proof that Y has this uniform distribution. So I'll say, the probability of y less than small y is the probability of the x put into its own CDF less than small y. If we assume from the start this equality, I just substitute that equality. Then if I take the inverse CDF of the left and right sides of this statement on the right-hand side, the inverse CDF on the right-hand side will cancel out the CDF, and I'll be left with an inverse CDF on the right-hand side evaluated at y. And then now this is the probability of x less than something which is just the CDF of X evaluated at that right-hand side. So I could turn this probability of X less than some number into the CDF of X evaluated at that right-hand side. But the CDF evaluated at the inverse CDF of Y, the, the CDF and inverse CDF will um, cancel each other, and I'll, be end up, I'll end up with just Y. Okay. And so if the CDF, and this, this left-hand side, this is the CDF for Y, the CDF for Y is equal to Y. Um, that means that Y has a uniform distribution. This is the uniform distribution CTF. 
with a lower bound of zero and an upper bound of one. Okay. So, so we can check things out that way. And then the idea would be then if I'm generating samples of this Y, right? So I'll generate a, a like a YI that's shown in this figure on the right hand side, wherever that is, it's, I know it's going to be between zero and one and any value between zero and one is equally likely. So then I'll take that YI and I'll put it into the inverse CDF, which if, if this is the CDF for X, the inverse CDF would mean supply the Y axis value and go find the X axis value. So I'll put it in. So this is the inverse CDF operation here. When I go from the Y axis to the X axis, I go find the X that's associated with that. And that's going to be my sample of my X. Okay. And you can see visually that if I'm plugging in values between zero and one, I can always evaluate this inverse CDF. And the part, the areas where the inverse CDF is steep, there's a lot of YIs that, that'll map into that particular area of the XIs. And so those are the XIs that are most likely, right? The steep CDF indicates kind of high likelihood of seeing observations there. The places where the inverse CDF is, is not so, or where the CDF is not so steep, there's not very many YIs that'll map into that range of Xs. So I'll get relatively fewer Xs samples in those areas, and I'll get relatively more in the places where the CDF is steep, which is exactly what I want. Okay, and we can always use this algorithm and plot histograms of the samples to confirm that they're consistent with our target PDF and things like that. Okay, so that's a, that's a basic tool we'll use, that's inverse method. We'll, we'll go beyond that a little bit uh, later on in the slides to, to deal with some more um, complex cases, but this gets us kind of our basic uh, tools for this Monte Carlo method. So uh, next video, we're going to talk a little bit about now how do we map this into our reliability integral that we've been talking about over the course of the quarter. That's it for this video.